Hello and welcome to Time with Pastor Otabel, our interactive discussion program that throws the light of scripture on the notable issues of our lives. My name is Albert Okran, and it's a joy to welcome you on behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otabel. For the past few weeks, we've been looking at Africa and God's purpose, and today we continue that all-important discussion, bringing us light and insight into the issues at stake. It's my joy to welcome Pastor Mensa Otabel. Dr. Otabel, good to see you. Thank you. What a blessing to be here again on this all-important subject. Amen. Let me welcome my colleagues. First, Reverend Eric Hermeku of ICG Soup in Heavens. Pastor Eric, good to see you. Thank you very much, Reverend Albert. And then Reverend Priscilla Nanankatia, ICGC Eagles Temple. Pastor Priscilla, thank you. Good so to see much. you. Doc, let's go to the very first episode and to your tracing of significant black presence in the scriptures, serving as scouts, priests, and leaders. What would it take to have black people significantly resume frontline positions in transformational leadership? I think black people are in transformational leadership. Um, I, I think what happened at the time of Israel's transition into the promised land was significant. Uh, and, and the fact that uh, the people who played this role, leadership role, were black people is significant to us. Uh, but it, it tells us that God is no respecter of persons that God can use anybody uh, for his purposes and, and that uh, the color of a person's skin is not determinant of their being used by God. So he can use black people, he can use white people, he can use Asians, he can use Australians, he can use anybody, and, and that everybody has a place in God's scheme. I think if you look at contemporary history now, we can see that uh, black people have significant roles to play. Off and on, they play significant roles. Apart from what we're playing in our own nations and, and what we're doing for our nations, uh, we also play uh, international roles. So I am not sure whether there is something extraordinary we have to do now to play uh, any major role in the world. I, I think we're, we're, we're playing our role in the world. Doc, in the narrative, one thing that caught my attention was the fact that Hobab, who you mentioned, was like a minority, but he provided leadership for such a huge multitude of people. And I'm asking, is there a correlation between that and, let's see, the Hushites, the Kushites, sorry, who, who came from a disadvantaged background, but who provided such leadership? I, I think so. I, I mean, the Bible teaches that God um, seems to have a commitment to the disadvantaged. And so when you read the Bible increasingly, you find that people who are disadvantaged, whether they are widows or orphans or strangers, foreigners, uh, the oppressed, the, the disadvantaged uh, occupy his thoughts. And uh, I think it's because he created all human beings. And so when one part of his image is disadvantaged, he steps in to correct the disadvantage. And, and that is why God takes the side of the oppressed against the oppressor. Um, and that is the, the revelation of the scriptures. Um, Mary, in her Magnificat, uh, said that he who is mighty has done great things for me. He has sent those who are full empty uh, away, and, and those who are hungry he has satisfied. So God has a way of uh, coming to the aid of his image, his, his creation that is disadvantaged. Uh, and it's something we have to take advantage of as well. Um, so I would not uh, look at those scriptural references as any special uh, role that uh, then distinguishes black people from other races of the world, as if God has a special affinity for black people just because they are black. But God has an affinity for people who are disadvantaged, and he comes to their aid to bring them on equal footing with other people so they can have a fair chance 
to live out the life that he wants for them. Doc, um, in your analysis of the interaction between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, you described the Ethiopian eunuch as a black man with great potential, um, but who did not understand what he was reading. Um, how do you think Africa can fully understand God's purpose for the continent? To understand God's purpose, you have to deal with him by yourself. Um, when we started relating to God, the God of the Bible, African always knew God. Um, so God was not introduced to the African. And God is not introduced to anybody. Uh, every people group in whatever setting they are, whether removed from civilization or not, uh, have a sense of God because God has revealed himself in his creation. So just by observing his creation, uh, people get to know that there is an owner of this existence, a supreme being, and, and, and they want to know him. Uh, the way to get him to know him may not lead to him, uh, although they're seeking to know him. So uh, the scripture says that people grope after him, but Christ is their perfect revelation that tells us to stop groping. And, and this is the way to the Father. Jesus Christ himself says, no one comes to the Father except by me. So our understanding of God uh, was pre-existed the missionary effort. But the missionary effort introduced us to Christ as the Son of God and the mediator between God and man. And Christ is what makes Christianity what it is. Otherwise, uh, there is deism everywhere. That people believe in God, uh, but the way to him, as we now know as through Christ, came to us through a missionary effort. Um, but as I have said, that understanding of God that came to us through the missionary effort also came with a baggage. And, and the baggage was uh, the culture where it came from. And sometimes it crossed purposes with the uh, colonial agenda uh, and other agendas. So at a certain point, you realize that understanding God for yourself uh, requires your own effort instead of depending of the, on the person who introduced Christ to you. You have to now take this uh, step to know Christ for yourself. And the African church has done that. African Christianity has done that. African theology has done that to a large extent. I mean, 50 years ago, we were not where we are now. There is now uh, indigenization of the African idea of God and, and his relationship with us. So we are getting there, understanding uh, and, and being able to decipher what God is saying to us at this point. I think one of the biggest challenge we have is even when we know the will of God, there is an enthroned image of a white man in our head that seems to give us the impression that even though we know God, uh, we are limited and there's so much we can do or cannot do. So that enthroned image has to be dethroned and let Christ take the proper throne in our minds uh, instead of a race as, as the example that we want to imitate or aspire to. So it's an individual initiative, individual responsibility. Yes, there is individual responsibility, but I, I think the church itself must get there. I, I think the African church tends to be preoccupied with uh, the felt needs of the people. Uh, and, and it's good to have your felt needs met. Uh, the, you know, people have a sense of insecurity, so there's so much emphasis on spiritual protection and, and safety spiritually. Um, but you don't become great by just being protected uh, from witches and wizards, but by self-actualization. So our messages have to go beyond these very rudimentary expectations of the people to calling the people to something higher 
that makes them want to live this noble life that God wants them to live. Africa clearly has had a very difficult past. Mm -hmm. But the prophecies, biblical prophecies, that points to the fact that there's hope and optimism for the continent. The prophecies in the Bible can be particularized. So when you read something in Isaiah, although the immediate audience was the, were the people probably who lived in Isaiah's time, there is an extended application of that word that speaks to me where I am. So uh, if we read that they, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, I apply it to myself. So in that sense, we can particularize the scripture to our situation because that's how the scriptures speak to us. The scriptures doesn't speak to us generally. It speaks to us particularly. So in that sense, the African Christian can look at promises in the Bible and actualize them in, in, in their lives. We can even take a step further to draw a relationship between narratives in the Bible in our own current narrative and see how what happened then is speaking to us now. So there, there, are, there are many ways in which we can draw linkages from scripture to where we are to speak to us, whether it's speaking to our underdevelopment or it's speaking to poverty or it's speaking to fear or it's speaking to overthrowing uh, the oppressor's image from your mind. Uh, all of these we can pick from the scripture. Uh, of course, the Bible wasn't written in 2020, so it doesn't address 2020, but it applies to 2020. It, it addressed a certain time frame, but its application has no time expiration date on it. The Bible can speak to all generations at all times, in all places. And in that sense, we can link up to prophetic declarations in the Bible. Doc, you mentioned. Um, earlier that the, the Europeans brought us Christ, but with some baggage, that is a cultural clothing. Now that the missionary effort has been reversed and we are sending Christ to the nations, how do we guard against a gospel exported from Africa, clothed in African culture? You can't avoid it. Because you, such as you have, you give. That's what Peter said, but it has a bigger application an African will preach from an African point of view. And so when you see the Christianity that Africa is taking to Europe, it is Africanized because it is speaking to the particular challenges of our time. Uh, so even if we're speaking it in a different geographical space, we're still speaking the message as we have felt it. Just like the Europeans brought their message as they felt it at that time. Uh, with, with whatever it meant to them, whether that same thing was relevant to us or not is another thing. It is very difficult to deculturalize the gospel message. It's very difficult because um, I said last week that the gospel always speaks to an ethnos or an ethnic group. And so, so you see the, the message to the Gentile church in the New Testament it's very different from the message to the uh, Hebrew church. Uh, the issues that are addressed are very different. Uh, and how the message is packaged or sent is very different. God speaks to us where we are. Uh, and so when, when God speaks to an African, the message is eternal, but its application is to the African. If God speaks to a European, the message is eternal, but its application will also be are particularized to, to those people. And we should not be ashamed to fully embrace our Africanness uh, in the message that God has given to us. Only that we shouldn't freeze our Africanness in time to say that uh, because the African is always afraid of demons, we must eternally be afraid of demons. I mean, yes, historically, Africans are very sensitive to spiritual power play. Uh, that is the world we came through of, of all kinds of inanimate spiritual beings, tall, short, you know, broad trees, rivers, rocks, all of these spiritually animated objects. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's so, but that's how we envisage it. And we, when we become Christian, we, we 
project that same thing onto Christianity. And if we are not careful, we can also um, diminish the power of the gospel because our culture uh, becomes a limitation on how we, we let the gospel speak to us. So, Doc, in that case, there will be a lack of relevance if we are not careful in the context in which we find ourselves trying to export the gospel. The big difference between how the gospel is being projected from here to Europe and how Europe projected us is that when the Europeans brought the gospel here, they didn't have a European audience here. They had a totally African audience. So it was a totally European message to a totally African audience. We have an African perspective on the gospel, but primarily we are speaking to the Africans in the diaspora. Uh, they are probably about 90% of the message that is going out. And so there is a certain continuity uh, because uh, you know the African who is afraid of witchcraft at home is also afraid of witchcraft in Los Angeles, uh, and and <laughs> so so uh, you know we, we we don't lose our fear, and so you find that the same message that uh, speaks to the African at home is speaking to the African also in the diaspora. It's only in the second and third generation that that message will begin to have a different application to a people who have now. Uh, acculturated uh, in, in, in that uh, environment. Doc, I really like this expression. I like the way you, <laughs> you break it down. Pastor Priscilla. <laughs> Doc, some have looked at Europe's recent spiritual decline, mm -hmm. you know, after leading um, great missionary work and have suggested a link to their development. How would we guard a prosperous African continent from becoming more secular or compromising the gospel? Well, if you read the Bible as far back as the book of Deuteronomy, when God was giving instruction to Israel as they were getting ready to go to the promised land, these are people who have been in slavery for many years. They've been in the wilderness. They've experienced the power of God. Now they're about to enter uh, the promised land, and God speaks to them to remember that when they prosper, uh, that they don't depart uh, from, from the gospel uh, or from, 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 from God. So you find that the whole idea of people who feel physically satisfied, uh, losing a sense of their spirituality is not a recent thing. Uh, God himself saw Israel going through that. And if you read the story of Israel, that's what happened to them. When, when, when they had peace, uh, they worship God for a while and then go into apostasy. And then, you know, something happens, there is revival, and then they go back. And so this whole idea of human beings feeling they don't need God uh, when they are okay is a, is a question of the human heart. It's not a European problem. It's not an African problem. It's a human problem. Human beings always want to feel that they are okay by themselves without accountability to God. So once they feel they have mastered the environment a little bit, they get accountable to God. But isn't it amazing? Anytime they are shaking, they go back to God. Uh, even during this recent pandemic, you know, the, the people who were godless were beginning to go back to God because uh, there is a human tendency to take God for granted when we are okay. So, yes, um, we could get to that point um, if, if uh, we, we, we live it that way. But I would rather we see our life like David, who was close to God when he had nothing, and actually closer to God when he became a king and had everything. So there is a sense in which uh, God can be the center of our lives in riches, and in poverty. And um, I hope uh, that that is what we are looking for. If we're looking for God because we are looking for help for our deprived condition, then when the condition eases, we would not need God again. But if we're looking for God for who he is, then no matter how much we are blessed and how well off we are, he'll still be the center of our lives. And I think that what you said before, 
about the church playing a role could also be crucial in this. Yes, uh, uh, for now, the church's messages are very remedial uh, because we are looking at the state of the people, you know, and preaching the message that addresses their state. People who are in trouble, people who are sick, people who are, you know, all the, all the pains of human life. That's where our message is. But we have to also graduate that message to center it more in Christ so that people don't take prosperity for its own sake and forget the one who prospered them. And, and the African church has to be very uh, mindful to rework its message uh, to keep the center of the gospel always firm. Uh, people having a relationship with Christ Jesus and, and, and adapting to life no matter what it brings to them. Keep Christ at the very center of the gospel. This is time with Pastor Otabel discussing Africa and God's purpose. And hasn't it been thrilling and inspirational? We'll go for a brief break. When we come back, there's so much more we want to know. Please don't go away. Welcome back to Time with Pastor Otabel. And if you haven't called someone you love, please call them, WhatsApp them, find them wherever they are, and let them join this all-important discussion about Africa and God's purpose. Pastor Eric? Yeah. The problem of African young people is that they are westernized and, and in philosophy and outlook. And it's as a result of some of them working in the, in the West and also schooling in the West. If this cannot be curtailed, how can we take advantage of this to influence our growth as Africans? It's always a double-edged sword. Um, Moses was taught in the court of Pharaoh, but he ended up upsetting Pharaoh's system. Uh, he's the one God brought out of Pharaoh's house to liberate the, the Jews who were under Pharaoh. So sometimes the liberating process or the liberation process requires uh, people being trained by the system that probably caused the oppression uh, because they have to understand it to bring people out. Um, so you see that with Moses. But beyond Moses, if you look at the um, African liberation effort uh, and the people who led it, uh, for example, in Ghana, as in many African countries, it was the intelligentsia, people who had been educated, whom the colonialists thought would side with them uh, to perpetuate their system. They are the ones, some of them had been trained outside the African continent, taken to Europe, uh, just like Daniel was taken to Babylon, and yet he ended up changing uh, the Babylonian system, so the Babylonian system submitted to Yahweh, the god of the Jews. Uh, we see the same thing happen in the colonial effort. So, uh, people like Kwame Nkrumah were trained in the UK and in the US, went to school there and came to lead the process. And, and you see that consistently in major thought leaders. Uh, some of the people who started writing extensively about black awareness, the, the French writers who wrote about negritude, were people who were trained in France. Uh, and they came up with, with a, a message that was very different from what they were expected to, to, uh, to, to teach. I mean, some of, the, some of the writers who started the African Writers Series had been trained in a system that was not supposed to make them write African Writers uh, Series. They were supposed to continue Gulliver's Travels and Robinson Crusoe, but they didn't write Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travel. They started writing about uh, uh, Okonko and uh, writing about uh, uh, all of these yeah. people. So you realize that the agenda uh, always includes people to understand a system that is supposed to be oppressive 
in order to bring liberation. So I think that um, it's a good thing for, for the generation to be that way. What we should be mindful of is that whilst being trained in the belly of that system, they must remember their home and, and, and what home is. And they must also see their privilege not as personal, but as representative of a people. So if you had the chance to go to school in the US or in the UK or in some other country, you shouldn't see it as a personal privilege that gives you an advantage over those who never went to school or didn't have the exposure you had. You should then see it as an opportunity for you to empower people. That is what Kwame Nkrumah did. That is what uh, uh, all the African leaders did. That is what the African writers did. That is what the liberators did. That's what Moses did. Um, that's what Daniel did. So uh, the, the, the opportunity God gives us to participate in a better system should not make them condemn our system, but to upgrade the system. That means that our prayer is that, like Moses said, he came into his heart when he was 40. Yeah. That season must come upon all Africans outside there. It has happened in the past. Uh, I think maybe the current generation may feel the opportunities they have uh, as a personal thing. And there is a sense in which, you know, when you think you become part of a better system, to look down on your own system and diminish it and think that it's the most quote unquote idiotic system on earth. Uh, because you see, many people have not taken time to understand the African society. And a lot of things we condemn about the African society, it's we condemn out of ignorance because we don't understand the thought patterns that have produced those systems and institutions. It doesn't mean that those systems and institutions are perfect and sacrosanct and should never be challenged and probably change. But we must change it with understanding, not with ignorance. Because if you change it with ignorance, you're going to knock off things which you shouldn't knock off, but straighten. And instead of straightening it, you're going to knock it off and there'll be no foundation left for the people. Doc, would you subscribe to the practice in some Asian countries to, as it were, deliberately export their brilliant minds to go and study and come back with an agenda vis-a-vis -vis the general perception that this is brain drain. Once they are going out, it's a drain on us. Would you subscribe to the deliberate export, as it were, of brains to it, do it, it and the study? It works. You know, I, I think one of the things we should be praying for and trusting God to help is to give us a sense of nationalism and a, a national selfhood. You know, uh, if a Japanese goes anywhere to study, they could be in that place for 40 years, but they would not lose their selfhood. The Chinese will not lose their selfhood. They can learn everything in that system, but they never lose their selfhood. I think for some reason, uh, our people, and I can say it's not even a cross-board African. I can speak for Ghana, that Ghanaians tend to lose their national selfhood very easily. And other African countries, but I'm not a citizen of their country, so I'm not going to pronounce on them, but they lose their selfhood very easily and instantly want to imitate and ape up and, and try to be what they are not. Somebody get a little stay in America for three years, four years, five years, and come to Ghana, uh, and all of a sudden th feels that everybody uh, is senseless. Nobody knows what to do. They have all the answers because they have been part of another society. But they, they forget, I've, I've always said this, that it's like somebody who lives in a, in a boy's quarters, in a very, very plush environment. Uh, yes, you are in the environment, but you're in the boy's quarters of that. And you didn't build that environment. So although you think it's superior and you are judging your own country with it, you were not a participant in its development. So even if you were left alone, you can't create what you saw. And that is where a lot of people who travel outside come back very critical of our system and given opportunity mess up big time 
because they have seen something they didn't create. Now they have to be humble to say, I only saw it. Now I have to go to my country and see whether I can interpret what I saw in my own country and make it work. And it is that humility that would make uh, the new African uh, become part, or the new African in the diaspora become part of the uh, development of the motherland. So that's very thought-provoking. Very. Hopefully. Very, very. <laughs> Doc, let me go to two scriptures that one talks about remembering the ancient landmarks, mm -hmm. and then the other talks about forgetting the things that are behind you and reaching forward to the things that are before you and pressing on and all that. How do you find the balance between remembering our history and then forgetting the blame game and just moving on with our lives? How do you find the right balance? Uh, we must remember our history uh, because we need a sense of history in order to have any vision of the future. Uh, the, the future is always a projection from, from the current and from the past. So the greatest visionaries do not envisage in a vacuum. The greatest visionaries have a reference point, And then from there they see. You know, God said to Abraham, stand here, lift up your eyes and see. So there's a point he's standing and a place he's looking at. Vision always requires a certain fixed point of location and then a certain expectation of the future. Those two are very important. It's almost like standing on your feet and lifting up your hand. One part of you is firmly fixed, another part is in the air. So we, we, there, there is a way in which we hold on to, or we understand, not hold on, understand our history and its implications, but we don't limit our expectations to that. Uh, so if I, I want to look at an African future, it must not look like the African past. So I am not looking at an African vision that makes me look like Okonfuanochi or Yasantua. That's my root. But the fruit must not look like the root. The fruit must look different. So sometimes when we think of African future, we, we see as a projection of the past. That was unfortunately part of the baggage of the early African uh, thought emancipation, especially from the French writers of Negritude, who romanticized the African past as this really beautiful, sacrosanct world that was rudely interrupted by the white man. But that world was not perfect. No society is perfect at any point in time. So we have to accept that there is an African past. It was glorious, it was beautiful, but we're not going there. We are moving from there. So our vision should be that we are creating something that honors the memory of our past, but not, does not repeat the systems of our past. And it is that ability to honor your past and still be different. That is what true vision is best out, out of. Doc, so looking at Africa's future, I want us to look a little at the role of the family. Yes. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul reminded Timothy of the sincere faith passed on to him by his grandmother and his mother. And with your experience and all you've studied, what kind of parental tips would you give to the African family who are seeking to position the next generation at an advantageous place? The family is the rock of society. And when we um, trivialize it, we lose the future. A part of the problem of every society is when the nuclear family cohesion is disrupted. We need a father. We need a mother. That's the perfect. Sometimes you don't get the perfect, but we must strive for the perfect. And we must not uh, just allow ourselves to approximate. We must strive for the perfect. When this system is there in a lifelong engagement, because when we disrupt this unit, not only do we disrupt each other, father and mother, but you disrupt everybody coming out of it. And 
I don't see why, you know, sometimes people trivialize this as if it doesn't matter, you know, it's just my personal decision. No, it's a societal decision because these are the systems that hold, this is the nucleus that holds this whole element together and we must keep it. So we need responsible parenting. And, and by responsible parenting, I mean parents who take interest in their children and their development and, and help their children to have a sense of security and safety and protection. So they don't always feel like something is running after them, nobody likes them, they don't amount to anything. Parental affirmation is one of the most important things anybody needs. For just your father may be the poorest man, but if he believes in you, your mother can be very poor, but if they believe in you and they are there for you and you know they are there for you, you will amount to something. And, and if we want to build a strong African society, that's where we, we get it, from the family. It is from this environment that talent is discovered, gifts are discovered, relating to people is developed. Um, being able to work with other people. All of that comes from the family. Um, unfortunately, I, I think that we are trivializing the family. I've seen it in other black communities in the diaspora where uh, families are fatherless. It's just uh, single mothers. And the, the rate of uh, deviant behavior and, and all that it comes with in the society is predominant in these environments. So we must not repeat that. We must build strong families out of which we build security for children who grow to discover who they are and live out their lives. And it is in the family system that values are passed on. Um, parents may not have a lot of money, but if, if they build self-esteem, that's the greatest treasure you can give your children, self-esteem and, and, and the ability that they can face the world and they can win even though they don't have much money. So there must be a lot of education to get people they to have rise to be, up to their uh, responsibility. There have to be, um, hmm. I think the church must play a role. Unfortunately, you know, the, the church in Africa tends to be very... Uh, very nomadic uh, in how it approaches things. It's constantly moving. It doesn't have firm foundations. So instead of it becoming an anchor for society, it trails society and adapts to society. Uh, but the church must become an anchor. Uh, and so when society is going stray, we are the ones holding the society firm in an anchor. And that means that we must have values that are non-negotiable, that we stand for and stand by in order for society to have an anchor. It doesn't mean there won't be problems in the church or in society, but there has to be something that is trying to hold the society uh, on, a, on a firm footing. This is Time with Pastor Otabu, a discussion that is getting even more exciting as we go along. And let me remind you that you can call a loved one to be part of this discussion as we explore Africa and God's purpose. We'll go for another break. When we come back, let's push on further and explore more themes under this all-important subject. Please don't go away. Welcome back to Time with Pastor Otabo. This is an interactive discussion about Africa and God's purpose. Pastor Rick? All right. It is estimated that 60% of the population of Africa are the, are the under 25, making Africa the, the, the youngest continent. But many of the young people in Africa are saying that don't see us as the, as the future, but we are the leaders today. Well, so, if they, they're the leaders today, then uh, they must lead. So what basic do you have for the young African continent? Um, 
You know, it's good to have what we have now because you have a workforce that hopefully can be active for the next 50, 60 years. Um, so if they are prepared well, this could be the finest uh, moment. For, thankfully for us, life expectancy is, is growing. Um, not too long ago in my own lifetime, life expectancy in Ghana was about 45. Uh, and I saw it get to the 50s, and I think it's now somewhere in the 60s. That's, that's something to cheer about. That means that anybody who is uh, 20 now uh, can aspire to go into their 70s and so on. I mean, child mortality is down. Um, mortality out of pregnancy, childbirth is down. There, there are numbers that favor us, and that also tells us that these numbers can be harnessed properly. Um, the church must play its role, and quite a bunch of these people are in the churches. My wish would be that the church, instead of affirming the fears of the people, must help the people to aspire beyond their fears. Uh, so people go to church, they must not just go and repeat the fears of their culture within the church. If, if we do that, we are not transforming anybody. We, we must help society to transform. Um, young people must, must take up responsibility very young, uh, very early. Um, even if they see bad example, they must determine not to be the bad example. Um, I mean, it's, it's easy to make excuses, you know, nobody took care of me, I didn't have a good example. But we all inside us have a sense of what is expected. And even if you don't have the best example, then you can create an expectation for yourself and live up to it and, and, and hope that you end up better than the generation you think has disappointed you. So <laughs> let's go to a theme that is very, very interesting. So throughout the scriptures, it would seem that unity of mind is very helpful for sustained growth and development. Our mode of competition for political office can be very heated and intense and sometimes threatens to spill over into every other aspect of our lives. Your personal opinion, do you think our mode of political competition or engagement is inimical to our development as a continent? What I can say is competition is not all that bad. Um, it's necessary sometimes for refinement of ideas and for the emergence of better outcomes. Um, the, the, the whole of nature is wired in a competitive way and in the process bringing out the best in us. But there is a way in which competition doesn't bring the best in us. It can bring the West in us. So what we have to ask ourselves is the competitive system we are creating, is it bringing the best out of us or the West out of us? Uh, we started multi-party democracy in 92. We've traveled long enough to this time. So at this time, we should be able to have a qualitative assessment. Has this arrangement brought the best in us? Or not? is it bringing out the best in us? Is it helping us to get the best ideas, the best people uh, to be engaged in the public space? Uh, those are questions we have to ask ourselves because competition can bring the best in you and, and, and the West in you at the same time. Now, just for context, let me see that 92 was for the uninterrupted flow of multi Yes, I'm, I'm just, yeah, that's what I'm saying, that our current, current democratic current. experiment, um, it's no longer an experiment, reality, reality. the constitutional rule is, is, is that. This is the first time since 92 that we are seeing political competition um, play out. So I'd like, like us to look at um, our work ethics and some of our practices that have been barriers to development. For example, um, lack of punctuality, laziness, excuses, polygamy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do we radically transform some of these <laughs> unproductive lifestyles and work ethics? <laughs> um, you know, 
when you take a Ghanaian, you know, a, a, a Ghanaian who is not punctual, and he goes to work in Germany, they are punctual. So the problem is not the Ghanaian. Because if he is the one who is not punctual, he will be not punctual in Ghana and not punctual in Germany. Uh, but how come when he goes to Germany or go to Britain, he's punctual? How come the person who works for a few hours and just takes off, goes to the UK and does three jobs and works all the shifts well? So basically, there is no problem with the human being. There's not, no problem with his mind. There's no problem with his personhood. Uh, so if the person is not the problem, then where is the problem? So that's where we have to answer the question. So um, <laughs> I, 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 I think human beings conform, and they conform to systems. Um, when there are no systems, there's nothing to conform to. When you go to a place like the U.S., I mean, look at what is happening now with no police, law and order being removed. Look at the kind of chaos they, they, they are producing. I mean, these are people you thought were all together, but they are not all together. It's the system that makes them all together. Once the system is disengaged, you'll be shocked what human beings can do. There is no disciplined human being anywhere by themselves. It is a system that creates that discipline and people conform to that system. And, and so I don't think there's a problem with the Ghanaian or the African in any form or fashion because we, can, we have shown adaptability in, in all kinds of places. We go to work in Singapore and do well. I mean, there's such a rigid environment. We, we survive there. Uh, we go to work in uh, austere regimes and we, we survive. We go to work in highly productive environments and we survive. We work in highly productive scientific institutions and we survive. So, so how can we say there's a problem with the person? There's no problem. But it is where we are placing the person. And part of my concern with the current political arrangement is that I think we are degenerating to a point where the government feels its role is to please the people. And when we get to that point, we are done with. The government is not there to please the people. Government is there to police the people, to create a system that helps the people to function intelligently. Somebody made a comment about, just to follow up on the point you just made, about systems versus people. Somebody took an overhead shot of greater works Mm -hmm. with people seated. And the person said, how can people sit down for five hours in rows, things being shared in minutes and everything being done in the same environment? And that person was trying to just allude to the fact that the system made it's a them... Systems. It's, it's systems. People conform. If you create it, they will conform. And, and it, it, it's, it's not magic. It's not rocket science. It's very simple. Um... We know it. I mean, when you're at home, your parents say you have to do homework at this time, sleep at this time. You find pretty soon your grades are improving, you know. And then if they say, oh, just watch TV, just relax, eat whatever you want, open the fridge at whatever, degeneration takes place. You know? So isn't it amazing that when God took Israel out of Egypt, the first thing he did was to give them very severe laws. Very severe. I mean, you wonder. These people are in the bondage. Give them freedom. He doesn't give them freedom. He says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. If you do, I'll kill you. <laughs> Basically, that's what he told them. Because he understood human nature. He made us. And he knows that we cannot operate without a system like that. So the best you, doesn't you come out of it. strict enforcement. Yes. Strict yes, laws. yes, yes. Interesting. So, Doc, <laughs> at this stage in Africa's journey, what battles must we avoid? Which ones must we prioritize? And if we are going to prioritize, which tools and weaponry should we use? The problems we have are so many that priority becomes almost an exercise in futility. Um, 
what should you do first? Should it be education? Should it be health? Should it be so many of them? If I am to prioritize, I think we have to prioritize creating a regulated society that gives us the shapes and the forms we should work within and conform to. And we don't, it doesn't have to be harsh, but it has to be clear. Uh, and we have to be guided to conform to proper living. Uh, other than that, um, we would just be doing activities and building things which have nothing in the transformation of society. It, it's, if you study every society that has transitioned from underdevelopment to development, the first and the most important component was a regulated society. Then the rest made sense. Otherwise, we'll build things and mess them up. It's really worrying. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, um, I, I feel that we can overcome it. We <laughs> Look, can make it if better. If Africa were to miss this season, what would be the implications for the current and future generations? Uh, well, the retrogression widens, the gap widens. Um, it gets more difficult for us. I mean, if it's difficult for, for us, it would be far more difficult for our grandchildren and far, far more for those who come, come after them. So there has to be a generation that starts closing the gap so that it's a bit easier for the next generation. Thankfully, Africa is not one monolithic society. You know, there are spots on the continent where things are being done well. And if you check in all the spots where things are do being done well, it started with a regulated society. It's not just the building of things, it's the regulation of society. That is the, the, the bedrock on which civilization takes place. What can I say? This has been time with Pastor Otabel, very revealing. And I want to tell you something, just bookmark at Mensa Otabel at ICGC Christ and watch this episode over and over. And the more you watch, I have a feeling the more you will discover out of the truths that have been shared in this all-important discussion. Pastor Otabel, thank you so much for the insights. You're welcome. Thank you, Pastor Eric, for joining us. <laughs> it's been very revealing today, hasn't it? Very been? revealing. <laughs> Pastor Priscilla, I'm sure if I asked you your favorite point, you would struggle to find which one it is. Yeah, but, uh, but the church needs to watch the message, the wow. message of the church. It, it resonated with me. We definitely will come back to that theme yeah. and ask more questions about what to do as a church. Pastor Tabel, our listeners and viewers definitely are leaning forward and asking, how do we get it right? What must we do? What will be your message to them and your prayer? for our viewers? I mean, we, we, we make improvement on very many levels. There's personal improvement. There's the family and its improvement. There is groups, churches, societies, smaller groups. Then there is the nation. I think many times we only see the nation as the only place for improvement. But we, we have to graduate it. We have to move it systematically from yourself to your family. Be determined to build a family system that produces excellence from, from the children that are born out of it. Uh, then you look at if you belong to a church, then we build it at the church level and, and continue building. So I pray that for each one of us, first, don't be discouraged. Don't be overwhelmed. It seems very daunting, but we, we will overcome this. I have every confidence that we will. And I pray for you that God will make you an instrument of change, an instrument of transformation, personal transformation. Uh, may God give you the grace. May God give you wisdom and the courage and the ability to nurture a better life for yourself. May the Lord help you to build a family that is nurtured. And may the Lord help you to build systems and institutions and companies and churches that are well nurtured. And eventually, may the Lord help us to build nations and a continent and a diaspora of people 
that are well nurtured, who can rise up to fulfill destiny in a very beautiful and supernatural and miraculous way. And may the help of God be upon you. In Jesus' name, amen.